All right, continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Terry Baxter and Paige Molnux. Terry has been an archivist for 33 years, the last 20 with the Multnomah County Records Management and Archives Program. He helped establish the county archives in 2001 and continues seeking ways to use it to assist both county programs and the public with their research needs. He is a member of and has served in a variety of leadership positions in uh, Northwest Archivists, Society of American Archivists, Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries and Museums, Archive Leadership Institute, and the Academy of Certified Archivists. He has presented and written on tattoos as personal archives, documenting domestic terrorist archives as tools of power structures, a diversity and inclusion in the human record, community-based archives, archives of state-sponsored surveillance, and a variety of other topics. He is a proud local 88 member and a proud public servant. He lives in Cully with his wife and brother-in-law and is frequently visited by 10 kids and five grandkids. Paige serves as the digital archivist for the Multnomah County. In this position, she captures, arranges, describes, preserves, and facilitates discovery of the archival electronic records of the largest county government agency in Oregon. In 2020, she led the configuration and launch of the county's first publicly accessible digital archives. She particularly enjoys innovating creative opportunities that inspire current and new users to engage with uh, archival records. She created her first database of records at the age of 11. It was a catalog of her great grandmother's uh, prized roses. Today, though, they're gonna be talking about research rationales and strategies and the records and system they use to assist genealogists with their research. So without further ado, I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Terry and Paige. Yeah, so this, uh, this is the uh, geneal genealogical resources at Multnomah County, Oregon Archives. And a couple of these initial slides will just be, uh, so you'll have some information later on if you need it. Um, this is the agenda for today broadly, but again, if you have questions or want to jump in with anything, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, you've already had our introductions, and uh, so we may as well just go ahead and jump right into um, uh, the presentation. So we're going to start out with a personal tale of genealogy, the tale of the Cherokee princess. Uh, my father-in-law had uh, a sig significant amount of family lore around their supposed uh, native ancestors. And this is a common trope, uh, especially in some parts of the country that uh, there's somehow some Indian heritage or uh, some sort of, uh, you know, princess background. Norman's story didn't involve a princess, but had a, a strong sense that there was uh, native uh, heritage in the family. So, about three years ago, we all decided, all of, all of the family members decided to take some ancestry tests, right? And so we took the tests and they came back and I'm sure you can guess what the percentage of uh, Native American ancestry was on this ancestry test. It was zero. So we, you know, kind of said, well, maybe this is just one of those stories then, you know, the stories, stories develop somewhere and people talk about them. And uh, so um, uh, Norman gave me a packet of photographs about a year ago and I was looking through them and all of a sudden there's this uh, photograph of a woman uh, wearing either very elaborate uh, native uh, clothes or perhaps regalia, I'm not sure which it was, uh, with, it, with a really young, uh, obviously white girl. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on with this. And so I asked Norman about it and uh, he didn't know the full story. So I went and talked to uh, his sister-in-law and it, it came out that his great grandmother was a, uh, full uh, enrolled member of the Cherokee tribe and had adopted his mother. And the, uh, at the time that, that, that would have made uh, total sense as, you know, his mother being raised traditionally as a Cherokee in a Cherokee family. And um, the, the pictures, uh, you know, is, is good documentation that that this relationship was not a, you know, was not 
the, the, the family lore had something based in fact. And one of the things that has really struck me about this is that, uh, you know, there's, there's two kind of streams that run. I think this is important to genealogical research. The, the streams are lore, the stories, the kind of things that we tell each other. And, uh, you know, whether it's families, communities, cultures, even nations have these kind of stories about the past. And then there's factual support for the stories. And in this case, the, the, initial, the initial evidence was, well, there's obviously no support for this story. But with a little more research and a little more digging, and now you can look at birth records, tribal enrollment records, adoption records, and see that there is actually factual support for the story. And that uh, Norman does have tribal ancestry. And I, I think it gets back to the point that to have kind of like a full and true uh, history of a family or of a, a community, they really need to have both things going on. You need to have factual evidence that tells you, you know, that there's support for something, but you also have, this, have to have the story itself that kind of gets you started on the, uh, on the journey. So we can go to our next one page. So why genealogy? So as was meant, as uh, Sue had mentioned earlier, I've worked as an archivist. And of course, if you've worked as an archivist, you are always working with genealogists. So I've worked with genealogists for 35 years now. And I have some, you know, kind of some observations and perceptions around genealogists. I think some genealogists like, just like filling in the puzzles. You know, there's, uh, you know, there's a long stretch of folks in these family trees. And I think people can, uh, immediately just um, look into that and uh, and say, well, here's a gap and I need to fill that in and how do I need to do that? And so I think that that uh, kind of genealogist is interested in the factual information that completes and authenticates their family relationships. But I also think some genealogists are looking for specific answers to a question. It could be health related. I get a, a lot of requests for information that would indicate like a family and inherited uh, health condition. Might be, could be related to membership. I had uh, fantastic uh, uh, research requests many years ago about a woman who was trying to get Swedish citizenship and she needed to get naturalization records within 10 days. And anybody that's worked with naturalization records knows that you're not going to get naturalization <laughs> records in 10 days. But uh, uh, we were able to find something in our voter registration records, which uh, when she contacted the Swedish folks uh, said that, that was acceptable evidence and she was able to get Swedish citizenship. And, uh, you know, so I mean, that's another reason people might want to do it could be related to different types of inheritance, property rights, so forth. I think the real, in my mind, the real key for, for genealogical uh, work is you're looking for connection. There's a, a sort of sense of belonging to family or community through time and an understanding of how we are today is, is based and grounded in how people were, our ancestors were going back generation after generation after generation. And there's an interest in meeting people from the past and getting to know them better, not in a factual way, but as actual individuals who have ties to us and who actually reside in our bodies. Uh, I, I really like, uh, uh, there's a, a Native American principle called the seventh generation principle, and it's been commodified in a lot of ways in modern society. But Vine Deloria talked about the seventh generation principle and how rather than spending our time looking uh, 200 years into the future and thinking about how we might think about that generation and what, what we do might affect that generation, that we're better off looking at ourselves as in the middle of those seven generations, that what we're really doing is we're trying to transmit information, stories, the essence of our great-grandparents, grandparents, parents to our children great uh, grandchildren, great grandchildren, that, that we should see ourselves as kind of like torchbearers for this information to move it forward so that the wisdom of people that we actually may have even known. I know I knew four of my great or three of my great grandparents and uh, hopefully I'll meet some of my great grandchildren. And so you're transmitting information from people that you actually know 
to another group of people that you hope to know. And that if we see ourselves that way, we'll, we'll continue to move those stories through time in a much more relational, much more human way. So we can move to our next one now, Paige. Terry, can I just do a quick tech check? Um, are you yeah. seeing um, just the slideshow or are you seeing my whole screen? I see just, I, I think I see your whole screen. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was might be the case. Um, not quite sure how to fix that. Um, um, Paige, we're, we're seeing just your presentation on our end. Hit up. Oh, you are. F11. So, so you don't see my, um, That'll my hide URL? The menu bar. That'll hide the URL if you hit F11. Oh, it's, F11. It's probably because I'm a co-presenter, Paige. There ah, you go. Perfect. There we go. Yeah, Thank you, Todd. <laughs> All right, carry on. All right. <laughs> so here, here's some examples you know, from our, from our holdings. And uh, I think that some genealogical research is pretty easy. Um, something like the, the this is a, a page from our poor farm registers, which uh, I'm not sure California or wherever you are coming in from had exactly the same structure, but in Oregon, they set up uh, county poor farms, which were uh, funded and uh, in, in Multnomah County's case, uh, they produce enough food to feed themselves, feed the uh, folks in the jails, and feed the folks in the county hospital. And the poor, <coughs> excuse me, the poor farm operated from about, at its current location from 1911 to 1982. And it's a really valuable genealogical research be, or resource because it has a lot of information on it and it is fully indexed and the index is online. And so you can see things in here like uh, that are not found in vital records, friends and non-parental relatives, medical condition, you know, whether somebody is indigent, uh, but it also has uh, really easy to get to information about, um, you know, nativity, parents, where they lived, how old they are, where they were born. And then the, there's some other, there's uh, notes in here as well. Uh, for some folks, there's a full series of correspondence in this uh, collection, not in this particular record, but in the, the collection from the poor farm of correspondence about residents. And so you can find some deeper information. There was one character there evidently who was only, only could stay in the poor farm for about a year because he continued to go into Troutdale and sneak liquor back into the uh, poor farm. And uh, there's a lot of correspondence back and forth with his family about why they're finally going to have to let him go from the poor farm. So again, you've got a ton of really useful information here that's, uh, you know, I think any genealogist and actually many genealogists do, we get a lot of uh, requests for this information. So you can, you can do stuff to fill in kind of like the, uh, the, the, uh, the family trees, but you also can sometimes find some really detailed and interesting information about uh, the individuals themselves. Um, the, uh, as I said, this has been indexed uh, uh, and the index is available online. It was done in a collaboration with our local genealogical forum. So folks came in and for about a year did the, uh, did the um, indexing for this. Um, one of the things about the indexing that we may expand is the indexing only contains some of the fields. And so there may be other fields that we might wanna expand that to. But uh, Paige will talk about some of the, the actual images uh, a little bit later on. And uh, I think this is one of those series that uh, I'm trying to think if there's another, another group of records that we've had in our holdings. I don't think there is. This is the only record that was ever uh, that has uh, HIPAA restrictions associated with it. And uh, the very latest book, uh, there's eight books in this, uh, in this group of records. And the very latest one still has HIPAA restrictions. Before they made the change to, uh, you know, 50 years after known date of death, we had to redact all of the information for requests, all the medical information for requests. And now we just have to redact that to the latest book. And so that's... Uh, it, it was kind of odd to me to have a record in the archives that had that kind of restriction because most of them don't. But uh, um, 
So that's that's kind of an example of, I think, of one of our records that's pretty straightforward and you get a lot of information, a lot of bang for buck for digging into this kind of a record. Go ahead, Paige, thanks. Then you can dig deeper into records. And I think that's one of the things um, that I've, that, that I found about genealogical research is getting 75 or 80% of it uh, done is really pretty straightforward. And then it gets harder and harder to fill in those individual pieces. And I think they get more, they're kind of more valuable and also more, there's kind of a yay moment when you find a piece of something that's, that's you haven't, that you, that you really uh, have been looking for and it finally shows up. This is a group of records here. This is a voter registration card um, from Hattie Redmond. And we are one of the few counties that has voter registration cards. They uh, have a retention period in Oregon of two years. And we inherited, when I, by we, when I came on and started working on setting up the archives, um, there was all of this microfilm of the voter registration cards from 19, they go from 1908 and uh, 19, or in 2010, I believe, 10, 2010 or 2011, the state took over all election related uh, registration. And so the counties no longer do voter registrations. They, they facilitate it, but the records are maintained by the state elections division. So we have this collection that's about uh, 100 years of voter registration cards. And this is one of them. And you can see on it that it doesn't have a lot of information uh, that you would, that you wouldn't be able to find, that you probably wouldn't already have. What it does have is it has some information about, so you can tell that Hattie is a Republican. You can tell that she registered in 1913. She registered in precinct 41. So you could find some precinct related records to kind of see some information about that. You can infer that she was a first time voter since Oregon women received the franchise in 1912. So she probably registered as soon as she could. And, uh, but what you don't know from this is that she was a black woman working in suffragist and black liberation efforts. She was married. She was buried in Lone First Cemetery. So what you found in this particular piece of uh, in this particular record is some really precise things that kind of fill out the story, but they don't, they continue to not tell you the whole story. And that's kind of the point of this particular record, I think, is that um, trying to tell the whole story about somebody takes a lot of work. And I know as genealogists, you know this, and that's one of the things, my daughter is very into genealogy. And that's one of the things I admire about her is she's, very dogged in her attempts to find out every piece of information she can about people. And I think it's because she's trying to learn more about who they are and what they are and how that relates to her. And so even something that's kind of esoteric like this provides a little more information and a little clearer picture of what, you know, of what a person is. And I think and part of that digging and part of getting that clear picture is to contextualize people in a different way than just as, you know, what might appear initially from a record. So this is from a group of records called the Criminal Registers. And they, uh, our, our versions of them date from 1929 to 1942. At first, I thought it was a booking record, but I don't believe that's the case. I think it's more uh, sort of a sort of a tracking record for people that have uh, been arrested or encountered. Uh, the uh, this is from the county sheriff's office, so county sheriff's uh, officers at the time. And so, what you have here is Ernesto, and he is from the Philippines. And so you can see that there is quite a bit of background. There's an occupation on there. There's a build. And one of the few things that we have that I find really important is they all include a photograph and they're high quality photographs. They're, uh, I don't know if it shows up in this online version, but the, uh, the photographs are really well done and provide a good image. So there's some pieces of that that are, uh, you know, straight, there's some things in here that would be found in other sources, but a lot of this information is um, 
unique and the images are really unique uh, for for our records anyway uh, going back what would this be 70 70 to 100 years ago the uh, number of you know black indigenous people of color women uh, people in photographs is much much lower than it would be today and so in some instances I believe these images are probably some of would be uh, maybe just one of a few images of an ancestor that a person might find. And I remember watching one of the ancestry shows. I can't remember if it's Gates one or one of the other ones, but uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, people that he was interviewing found the only picture of her grand uh, grandparent that she knew that existed, and it was in Australian prison registry records. And uh, she broke down crying on screen because she'd finally seen someone for the first time that she'd heard stories about and had, uh, you know, had a personal connection to. And so I think that this is, this is really connective information. Uh, one of the, one of the other parts of it though, that I think is important to keep in mind is that if this is the first piece of information that you were to encounter, you would um, possibly say, Oh, wow, my ancestor was a criminal. And maybe that's true, maybe that's technically true. But if you look down towards the bottom of this, you'll see that the date of arrest was 7-18-1934. And the crime was the Syndicalism Act. And <clears throat> with a little more digging, you'll realize that Ernesto was involved in the, in the large dock strikes that were up and down the entire West Coast fighting for worker rights. And uh, often in the face of uh, police oppression. And so all of a sudden it makes the story a little more, there, there's a little more context to this story. Ernesto is not necessarily like a criminal. Ernesto is, uh, has been booked for sure, but is, has been involved in something that some would, some would call a, an act of resistance and you know an act to enable workers. And so making sure that you don't, see a person just on the first look of that record, I think is really important. And, you know, the, the, the story of our ancestors are like us. And I think that's something I often forget looking at historical records when all you have is, you know, we got a date of birth, we got a date of death, we've got, you know, some sort of racial information, perhaps we got a place that a person lived. Well, if you applied that to yourself, that'd be a pretty that'd be a pretty bleak picture of how you see yourself. And I think that our ancestors are as complex and as varied and as colorful as we are. And I think remembering that there's a lot of pieces to a genealogical story, I think humanizes folks and help, helps remind us that we are dealing with a long chain of human beings that came to get us to this particular point. Yep, I'm ready, Paige. And then there's the mysteries, you know, and I think every genealogist is going to encounter mysteries in their, in their research because there's just not enough information about some stuff. What I know about this particular picture is these, the, it was labeled South Portland Branch. It was about 1920, and it was part of a large group of Multnomah County Library records. And... <clears throat> This, the, the, there's evidence here. There's clearly evidence. There's four kids. They look like maybe they know each other. They're out in front of the building. You can, you can see enough in the picture to know that is actually the South Portland branch, which is now a storage department for the city of Portland Parks, <laughs> Parks Bureau. But uh, so you know, you know a little bit from this picture, but you don't know who these people are. You don't know what, why this picture is taken. And so, I mean, I think that there's things, there's, there's some things nice about mystery in some ways. You can sit around and uh, talk with folks about, you know, what, what they think and you can, you know, kind of imagine what this might be. So there's an imaginary space here and you can kind of think about what this could be. But if you wanted to spend a lot of time doing research, you could also, you know, do some research into, you know, who lived in the area, you know, who were the kids in the 1920s? 
one of these kids is a black kid, and that is in Portland. That's significant. There, in 1920, there were not a lot of black people in Portland, and so you might be able to locate information and start to work from there. So, people that you know really want to find out more about this mystery, there there are ways to research it and maybe narrow it down. But uh, I also think that there's there is sometimes it's there's sometimes value in just having a mystery. Uh, one of the thrift stores here in town uh, sells a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, movies, old movies, photographs and everything. And they have a box called Build a Family. And uh, it's just a bunch of unidentified photographs that uh, evidently they think that you could go in and you could build yourself a family. And uh, I think the alternative to genealogy is sometimes kind of like a, I don't know what you'd call it, fictional genealogy. You know, you just kind of think, what could these people be doing? What could they be doing in 1920 and build a story around them? And I think that there's, there's, there's value in having this kind of space that is not nailed down and not perfect and not completely understood. So um, I, I think that that's uh, the idea behind uh, all of these examples that I've tried to that I've provided here, I think is that what we are really trying to do is understand the interrelatedness of human beings past, future, and present, and how our work as archivists and your work as genealogists is really important in figuring out how to get from what our ancestors wanted for us through what we want for our descendants and how how those things how those things come together through stories but they're important stories and they're they are a way of a, for us to envision what a future would be and get our ideas and the ideas of our ancestors to move us to that spot so that's my story today and uh, i'll pass this on to Paige, who's got other information about our holdings Hopefully, um, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> um, thanks, Terry. Um, my job now is to present the practical side of finding genealogical records in the Multnomah County archives. Um, I know a lot of you are already expert genealogy researchers. Um, so if it gets to a point where, well, I was gonna say where Terry sees eyes glazing over, but I don't think he's going to. So um, if, you're, if your eyes are glazing over, could you put eyes glazing over in the chat? And then Terry can give me some sort of digital nudge to say, get on with it, or we'll pull in the, the shepherd's crook, take me off the stage. Um, so, and also please feel free to put a question in the chat box or interrupt me at any time. Um, please don't wait if I, if it's a question about the, the process for finding something or if I'm mumbling or need to provide more explanation, it's just good for everyone to address that in the moment. Um, but before we talk specifically about uh, our genealogical records, I wanted to give you an overview of Multnomah County Archives public access systems. Um, we have two portals for finding archival records of the county. Um, the first one and most comprehensive site is our archive space catalog. Uh, if you've been looking for records for a while, you may come across other organizations that have this familiar interface. Now, here comes the tricky part. I'm gonna click on this and I'm going to see what happens. Hopefully, is everyone seeing? I'm seeing a nod from Terry. So it worked, yay, all right, great. <laughs> This may, so if you've been looking for records for a while, um, this is our archive space platform. Uh, it contains information about all of the collections in our archives. That includes our paper and analog records, and it also provides links to digital records when they are available online. Uh, we also have our digital archives. Uh, oh, nope, that's not right. Our digital archives. Uh, that um, have an online for less than a year. Uh, in fact, we launched it in June of last year, which was really good timing, considering that we had to discontinue in-person research after March of 2020, like everyone. Um, we originally launched with one series, our approved county budgets from 1980 through 2005. 
And now we have over 7,000 records and we're adding more each week. Uh, so we'll take a look at the catalog first. We already did. Um, I'm gonna go, go back there. And uh, here you can either search for a specific term or browse. Uh, oh, I'm seeing, yes, Jean, uh, provide the link to the research and the poor farms Terry talked about. Yes, I'm going to share with Sue uh, the entire presentation and it's going to be in a PDF and it will have clickable links in that, embedded links. Um, but if you'd prefer to have the actual URL as well, um, I can certainly add that to the slides before sending the PDF. Um, so if you do want the actual full URL in the, in the PDF, let me put it in the chat and I will add it to the presentation. Um, okay, so you may remember that Terry's favorite collections um, were the uh, Delta Recreation Commission records. So one way to find that would be to simply browse the collections by clicking on collections. And then you could scroll looking for the Ds, which would take a while. So instead, I'm just going to put Delta over here in the filter results. And here are the Delta Park Recreation Commission records at the finding aid. Yes, the URL will be helpful. Yes, I will do that. Um, I just need to write a note to myself so I don't forget. I put it in already, Paige. Oh, you did. Oh, great. Thanks, Terry. I should, I'm going to leave the chat alone. I'm not going to look over there. You're going to tell me. <laughs> um, so some collections uh, have more or less information. Uh, in this one, we have the scope and contents, the historical information. Uh, and if you click on expand all, you'll see the arrangement. Um, sorry, arrangement, et, uh, et cetera. Um, now uh, let's take a look at, I, so I shared earlier that my favorite digital records were something called multi. Who knows what multi is? Only one other person here knows what multi is. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put in multi in the search box. And there are two results. One's a digital object and one is a file. I'm going to select the file. And now we have an image of multi and we also have in our expanded metadata, some digital material. I'm going to click on that. And that's going to take you to where these records reside in our digital archives. Um, Multi, by the way, was a, a quasi mascot that appeared in several handbooks in the uh, 1960s. Here are some options for his, uh, his face. <laughs> we have several records on this. I, I just love them because they represent a certain time and place. Um, if you do find yourself here, we have a link back to where this record resides in our archive space. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, this is less than a year old, so we're still working on perfecting it. Um, but you can copy and paste the link into the browser, and it's probably gonna look exactly the same because it's exactly where we came from. But, now you're probably wondering, where are the genealogy records? Hang on. Well, let's get to it. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my presentation. And I'm not going to click on that. I'm going to click on this. Currently, we have four record series that could come in handy for the purposes of genealogical research. And I really appreciated what Terry was saying earlier about um, contextualizing these records because I often think of genealogical records simply as the vital records, so census data, um, birth certificates, marriage records. But the records that we have in our collections really do provide more information about people's lives, I think. 
So Terry discussed the poor farm emissions register. And yes, we have seven of the eight volumes available online. The eighth volume hasn't been digitized yet, um, but Terry can provide access, um, redacted access. The records may include, yep, he already went over what the records will include, so I won't again. We also have online the records of the county coroner's investigations from 1894 to 1923. The archives itself, full archives, paper and digital, has a combination of coroner's investigations, medical examiner reports, and death certificates. Certain record types have more or less or the same information as others. Terry has explained to me what information is on which record type, and I'm still trying to get it straight. So if you're looking for particular information, Terry's, Terry's your man. <laughs> uh, regardless, the coroner's investigation records that we have online may contain any or all of the following. The name of the deceased, age, gender, nativity, residence, date and place of death, date of inquest, cause of death, verdict of the jury, disposition of the body, valuables found on the body, and additional remarks if provided. And I will show examples of all of these records in a minute or so. We also have a volume listing the farms registered and recorded in Multnomah County from 1900 to 1965. Each entry may include some or all of the following information, the date of application, county number, name of owner, farm name, location, date of final registration, and post office address. And lastly, we have the county clerk's records of shipwrecks and any casualties. Uh, records may contain the date, location, and a description of the incident, the name of the ship, point of origin, and destination on the ship's route, and other quite honestly fascinating information. And I realize this is a little bit of a stretch, but it's for anyone out there who may have, may know they have an ancestor who um, worked, on a, worked on a ship or was a captain, or maybe all they have found is the name of a ship in a, in a letter. I can see many opportunities for using these. Um, and what's, uh, what's particularly interesting too about all four of these series is the varying degrees of their discoverability. As, as I'm going to show you, the admissions registers are, and as Terry mentioned too, the admissions registers are very well indexed and searchable. Um, the shipwreck casualties, on the other hand, are arranged alphabetically by vessel name. Uh, and additionally, trying to decipher the handwriting is not for the faint of heart. Uh, like the coroner's records and farm names uh, lie in between the two in terms of findability. So I'm going to start with the easy part. The poor farm emissions registers, 1900 to 1962. Our crown jewel. And Jerry, uh, Terry mentioned the, that the genealogical form of Oregon transcribed the index. So I'm just going to take a look. We'll just dive right into it. We also, in addition to having the searchable index, we actually have a research guide online, the first of hopefully many, which will give you an overview of the history of the farm, as well as how to find different methods for finding the records and uh, more information about the farm if you want to pursue that further. Uh, right now, I'm what what's super easy about this is that if you have someone's name, you can just type it right up here in the search box. Uh, and um, I I really love Scandinavia, so I'm going to look for the name of Lindquist. It took me straight to the registers index. And it doesn't always work quite like this, but it took me to a couple of inquests. If that doesn't, doesn't work quite like that, what you might, if it starts you at the top, you would want to search right here and find Lindquist. And there it is. Mm, I think I want to check out Auto Lindquist. What do these numbers mean? I'm going to make this bigger so it's easier to read. 
Lindquist Auto is in book number two, page number 323. And it looks like he entered the poor farm on July 20th, 1907. So I need to go back and find volume two, page 323, which can, I would just write that down because, or you can open up a new tab. Uh, right now, this is when I should tell you that as Murphy's Law would dictate, we had a bit of a system upgrade this week, just this week, which has caused a bit of an indexing error in the site, not this index, that has made things a little interesting. I'm going to click on one of these. This metadata is usually, usually clickable and will take you to the right place. This is going to be a surprise for everyone, me, if it takes me to the right place. <laughs> And it did, that's great. Uh, so I'm gonna find the Multnomah County Poor Farm Admissions Register. This is the actual register, not the index the, and all of the volumes. And this is the little bit of an indexing error right now. Uh, it's unfortunate that I'm saying this as this is being recorded. <laughs> Normally these are in order with volume one at the top. Uh, I need to find volume two though. Now you can look through the volume. We have the volume as one, one single document, but it's, it's, it has several hundred pages and it, it can take a little while. So I recommend if you can just going to the single pages and then searching within those for the page number that you were looking for. We were looking for page 323. And here it is. I am going to make this bigger. Now I can zoom in and try and find Mr. Lindquist. And here he is. So we can see uh, that Otto was Finnish. He was a laborer and he uh, suffered from hypochondria. What's interesting here too, though, is that it looks like he was readmitted and it says to see page 210. I'm going to look for page 210 now. Expand that again and find auto again. And this actually has a little bit more information about him, um, including how long he'd been in Oregon, um, former residence, and he originally was cured. But um, so these are the poor farm register records. And now we're gonna take a look at the county coroner's investigations, which we have from 1894 to 1923. I mentioned that these have varying degrees of uh, discoverability. This one has a digitized manuscript index. So it's not, but because it's a manuscript, we don't have the OCR on it. So you, it's not quite as easy as putting a name in the search box and then finding it. But the index is arranged alphabetically, which is helpful. Paige, Paige I don't mean yes. to interrupt, but could you explain to the class for the some of the beginners in the class what OCR means? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's optical character recognition. And um, if it's usually if 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 a, if, a, if, a, if a record is, is born digital, um, which means if it was created with Microsoft Word or if it, was if it originated electronically, um, indexes, indexers will, will find the characters of a word and be able to, uh, if you put in a search term, they will find that word within the document. Now we also, that's not exactly the same as OCR, but that's indexing for born digital. OCR, um, is OCR works by reading scanned documents and then um, 
and, and, and analyzing them and identifying characters so that the scan documents can be searched by character. So um, this, but this only works if you are scanning, typically, typically only works if you're scanning a typed document. So we have, I mentioned earlier that our budgets from 1980 to 2005 um, were our first, our first series. As you can imagine, the ones from the early 80s were were scanned. They were typed up and scanned. And but but even so, our digital archives um, automatically will OCR those, recognize the characters, so that you can then find um, you still search for terms and it will the, the results will include documents that were scanned. Was that a does that make sense the way I explained that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Excellent. Right, but oh, but the important part though is that OCR for handwriting, uh, it it probably exists. It probably exists uh, out there in in you know the wonderful world of private, lots of money tech. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> but we don't have that, and um, hopefully we will someday soon. Because, but it it's a uh, you know you may remember that handwriting from the early 1900s varied and was pretty ornate. So the technology to read that would be elaborate. Um, I'm, I'm now I'm spacing off thinking about how, how you would have a system do that. <laughs> the point is we don't have that. <laughs> um, but we do have an alphabetically arranged index. So if I wanted to find uh, a Lindquist again, I would go to this, the record of coroner's investigations, which has, it says in the description, um, it has an index. The first 38 pages of the of the actual volume were the index. I um, I have to confess that I don't have the letter in the title right here. The letter does appear in the metadata. What I mean is the the letter, the first letter of the last name. For example, this is supposed to be A and B. Um, Sorry for a moment there. Sorry, indexing, indexing fine. Here we go. Okay. So if I were to look for Lindquist, I would want to start somewhere thinking about um, 38 pages. L is going to be towards the middle somewhere. I might try um, page 14. And it looks like when I zoom in on this, this is I. So this is not L, and it's not what I need. Now I'm going to try. I'm going to try 18. I'm trying 18 because I already know that that's the right one. And you probably don't want to watch me poke around anymore. Here, so here. Oh, let me expand this so you can see it. Okay. The index is alphabetical by first letter, but it does get a little interesting here. It's not always in alphabetical order. The names are not necessarily in alphabetical order. So I kind of have to scan this until I find a Lindquist. Now I don't have, I don't have Otto Lindquist, but I do have John Lindquist. And it looks like he appears on page 25 of the of the volume that's not the index. So I'm going to go back and find page 25 in here. I should, I should say these individual pages that are scanned are all part of the same original bound book. I just wanted to clarify that. I'm going to try and find 25 in here. And I found, found the 25th page of the index, but I actually need page 25 of the investigation records. So I need to add an O. Here we are.
Well, let's take a look at these records. Find Lindquist. It's right in the middle of the page. <laughs> Is it right now? Yeah, it's J J N O Lindquist for oh. John. There I it saw is. it yesterday. Right there. Right, 26. Right, yeah. 26? No, right, right there. there. Yes. Right there. This is the, I have, I can't even, I can't even in my brain OCR. Sometimes. <laughs> so, we, yes, thank you. We see that he's 26. Also from Finland. Um, and, I mean, if anybody else wants to pop out and read this for me. He drowned. He drowned. Thank you, Todd. 1897. Is yep. that what that says? April 26th, accidental. Mm -hmm. So this is what our uh, coroner's investigation records look like. Uh, Terry, if there are other thing, other um, nuances to the record that you would like to add at any time, please feel free to jump in too. Yeah, the, the one thing that's... Uh... This, this book is really useful, I think, genealogically, because it's uh, compact and easy to get to. But there's also a series of coroner's inquests. So they provide, if, there, if one exists, they provide quite a bit more information. And a lot of people researching, I, I you know, whenever someone comes in researching, you have to kind of guess sometimes at what they're doing. But I think these are people trying to validate uh, sketchy family stories. And so they are looking to find out if the details of their story actually match what the coroner's inquest say. And so there, there is a separate group of records for that. The other thing, and Paige mentioned this, is <clears throat> Oregon's vital records system started in 1903. So the first part of this book is the only existing uh, records, uh, official uh, government death records, uh, for this area. And so, um, you know, if, if someone just needs a date of death, they'll probably go to a death certificate, but these records for the first part of this book are unique and, and would be the only place you could find that information. Terry, feel free to jump in more too. I, I've, I'm worried that what I'm doing is a little bit dry. So whenever anyone talks, it's great, wonderful. Anybody, Todd, I'm really appreciating um, you're co-piloting too. <laughs> um, okay. Now we've looked at the coroner's investigation records. I'm going to move on to, uh, actually, no. Are there any other questions about these? Are the, uh, are the actual inquest records digitized as well? They are not. They exist on microfilm currently. And so as long as they are, uh, are they subject to HIPAA as well? No, um, I believe that, I don't think we have anything, it's, what would it be, 50 known date of death, so that would be somewhere around 1970, I think, uh, so I don't, no, I don't believe that, um, I think they only go into the mid to late 50s, so they'd all be available. Oh, great, thank you. 1971, yeah. <clears throat> There are no more questions. I'm going to move on to the next series, which is the record of farm registrations. Uh, these are alphabetically organized by, um, I'm sorry, organized alphabetically by um, not just owner name, but also um, farm name, which is convenient if you know one, but not the other. I, again, want to know if a Lindquist owned a farm. This is the series in our digital archives. Um, these I described slightly better than the last ones uh, in that they, the title includes the letter. So I wanna find L. Again, I apologize for the indexing error. This is the, um, our vendor informed me that the only way to get it to sort correctly is to reverse order sort it and then sort it again. <laughs> it's fun. I'm gonna find L. I'm really gonna find L. 
Right, so um, actually I'm gonna go back there for a second. Um, you notice that there are two L's. One is the L's that list the owner names and the other one is the L's that are farm names. I want owners. Uh, oh, my mistake. One of, this one is the, this one is the farm name. Larwood is not, is not Lindquist. Black. Here we go. And there are no Lindquists who registered farms during this period of time. Um, but if I were looking for Fairview, farm, I would be able to find it in the Fs, theoretically. Um, we're not going to go into that, though, because I think this probably has shown you enough of these records. Um, yeah. <laughs> any more, any questions about the records, registrations, and farming? Yeah, I have a question. Um, if, if you know the exact location of the farm and the name of the farm, uh, if you wanted to get a, a, a like a map of that farm, would you have to go to like the county land records office? How would you, what would be the next step? That's a good question. Um, Terry has more experience with that than I do, so I'll let him answer. What I would do is uh, the county surveyor has an online system called SAIL, S-A-I-L. And uh, it, uh, you can, you can search it by location and find any associated survey records and other land records too. They've digitized quite a bit of stuff in there. And um, so I would just go to the spot and it'll probably almost for sure pull up a plat. And then it would, it would pull up any associated surveys, road records, land records, uh, both for that specific place in the surrounding area. You can actually choose as big an area as you want to, but the documents become unmanageable once you get uh, outside of a pretty precise location. You can search by an, an address, but some of these were probably old enough that they don't have an exact address. Um, I believe you can also search by township range section, so you could get to it that way too. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, uh, that'd be the first place I'd start. And then if, if that didn't turn anything up or it wasn't satisfactory, there's other mapping records uh, that, that might be useful both in the roads department and in the um, land use planning department. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Then we will go to our last series that I'm going to share with you, which is our shipwreck casualties. Uh, this was a bound volume at one point, but it was microfilmed. Terry, do you remember when this was, my, was it the 60s, 70s? When it was microfilmed? Yeah. Um, I don't know for sure, but it was uh, probably sometime between 1965 and 1980, because that was a large microfilming project. And 65 is when the clerk's office changed its uh, way of recording things. So that would be my guess. And we don't we don't have the original volume anymore. Is that is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. There were some notes on on this one um, that had been added by the um, person who microfilmed them. Uh, casualties is in quotation marks in the note, and we still call them that. But most, uh, at least the I've I've looked at a handful of them, and usually there are no casualties. <sighs> And I think that's why the casualties is in quotation marks on the note. Um, there were, there also, it's also missing the letter A, which the, our, the previous archivist noted. Um, there are only also, um, I think that they only scanned the pages that had content on them. They, there are 32 pages, but the actual numbers of the pages in the, that are scanned in the microfilm go from 10 to 200. In terms of, and I talked about why I thought they might be good genealogical records. Um, Paige, Paige, I don't mean yes. to, but I have a question. You had mentioned yes. that, that your office no longer has the original book. Do you know where the original book is? I don't. Um, 
Yeah, I, I uh, for all intents and purposes, almost all the books that were microfilmed in the 80s were destroyed. Um, that, that was fairly common practice for many jurisdictions at the time was to microfilm and destroy. I don't think that would be a good archival decision today, but that was a decision at that time. We do have the original D books from 1849 to about 1890 or so. Um, and just as happenstance, because the Oregon Historical Society had saved the books, and then uh, once we'd formed an actual archives here, uh, sent them back for us to store. So those are some of the few physical records we have, but a large, a large group of county records are maintained on microfilm only, or as pages started to digitize them, they also exist in digital form. I have noticed that um, the quality of the the quality of those um, microfilm projects is not always ideal, which is I think part of part of the reason Terry is saying too that it's not the best practice now. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so in terms of findability, um, shipwreck casualties are they're arranged alphabetically by the vessel name. Uh, these have um, the uh, legibility of the records are about, well, <laughs> maybe it's just me. Uh, maybe it's me. I think, I think Todd would be able to read them quite well. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I'm just going to, I think they're Peter interesting. Peter Iredale. Peter Iredale. <laughs> uh, BR. I'm not we sure. Can actually... Next to Ashore, Clots Up Spit. Uh, no, Cap no lives lost. Captain Lawrence, no lives lost. Total wreck. Sales were sold to Anderson and Crown Hall to Pacific <laughs> Iron Works. Five hundred dollars. Yeah, yes, that's right, and that's that's actually really interesting. This the hull being sold to the Pacific Iron Works is. Uh, I don't know the complete history. I'm not. I'm not a, an expert on shipwrecks in the area, but um, for this reason. I think it's interesting that it says that because the Peter Iredale shipwreck is, is famous enough to have its own Wikipedia page. This is an image of the ship from 1900 in Seattle. And this is where um, it's, it's the wreck that is recorded in our, in our book. Uh, the, the Peter Iredale was on its way to the Columbia, to Columbia, the Columbia River from Mexico when it ran aground near Astoria which is in the uh, northwest corner of Oregon. And it, um, it ran aground in October of that year. And I don't know how many people have been to the Oregon coast in the fall, but the weather is not always ideal. It's, it can be pretty rainy, pretty windy, pretty stormy. And uh, there was very little damage to the ship when it, when it, um, when it ran aground. Um, but the weather was so terrible that it took them several weeks. It took several weeks for the weather to clear up well enough for them to try and uh, pull it out and get it to a dock where they would be able to, um, oh, what's the word, Re resurrect it, if you will. And by the time that happened, it was stuck. It was embedded in the sand, and so it had to stay there. And today... You can still get to the Peter Iredale um, in Fort Stevens State Park. And this is where, if there is a ship expert in the audience, I'd like them to weigh in because my understanding was, I don't know, is the hull, does the hull include all of the bones of the ship or would, were they just peeling off, peeling off the sides and selling that? Terry, do you know? No. <laughs> well, I think the hull's the entire, everything but the too. sails. Yeah, right. So. I don't know what Pacific Ironworks purchased. <laughs> well, they probably found it too difficult to come and get that metal from that area. Right. I mean, obviously they've, I mean, you can't tell from the picture how much of the hole is behind the bow there. That's but, true. But trying to get it off the sand, I mean, you'd have to come out there by hand, cut the stuff up. This was in 1906. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would have been pretty difficult to 
salvage it, I would think. Definitely. Um, you know, I didn't actually get around to looking at the book in... Um, not to mention the tide artists. comes in there. So it does. It is. This is actually, this is a low tide. So you're only going to get, you're yeah. only going to get a certain periods of the day where you even be able to get to it. That's right. You're absolutely right. You can get to it now, but you're right. Only a low tide. Um, but if we want to take, well, you know, mm, 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 yeah, let's take a look at the records in the archives. Let's just take a look at um, P. This is not the correct series. I'm gonna look for shipwrecks. I actually kind of want, I want to find one where, well, you could see, you saw Captain Lawrence, so it did have a name there, but I want to find out. Oh, that doesn't help. You can see that they do occasionally have names of crew members. I'm afraid this, this particular format doesn't lend itself to being zoomed in on here. But um, yes, those are the shipwreck records. <laughs> are, are there any other questions about the shipwreck records? Comments I would from... imagine, Paige, that you could probably coordinate like newspaper coverage from that time period uh, with particular shipwrecks to these records, you know, cross-reference one to the other. Absolutely. Yes. Um, let me go back to the presentation. So as I mentioned, we, um, did someone, was that a sniff? <laughs> oh, maybe it was at um, our ladies here. Uh, <laughs> so I said, I mentioned that we're continuing to add records every week, every month. Um, and coming soon, we have uh, the, full, the full volumes of the criminal registers, uh, one record of which Terry shared earlier. We also have a lot of deed records that we are planning on getting online and our voting registration records. We also um, are in the process of developing a pilot project to, uh, um, to crowdsource transcription. Um, I imagine that many of you, if not all, are already familiar with the idea of citizen archivists and um, projects where you can go online and look at a record that is handwritten and type in what it says, which then creates a searchable index. This is what we do in lieu of OCR on handwritten doc records. Um, so we're planning on piloting a project and I just wanted to throw that out there in case anyone would be interested in participating in that. Um, we can add Sue to the mailing list when we get something closer. Uh, and then um, we'd love to have anyone participate. Paige, maybe we could have you back when you start that and you can do a demo uh, to the class on how to crowdsource. I'd love to. Yeah, for sure. That'd be great. Uh, now, be I know that you could probably not give me an exact percentage, but if you had to guesstimate what percentage of your archives are digitized, what percentage would it be? Oh. Under 10. Yeah. Under five, maybe. As a you know, as a, as a local government, um, digitization can be pretty expensive. And uh, we, it was actually, um, we had family search come in and do quite a bit of scanning several years back. But we are, we're looking at um, more digitization projects. I wanna get as much as we can online. <laughs> I think we have some really fascinating records and, um, having people from across the country and around the world access them online uh, is um, just, a, just the best for me. Uh, for me, just because I love, um, I love as, as I mentioned, in, as Sue mentioned in my biography, 
um, encouraging people to engage with archival records. And it's just a lot easier when you can do it from even your phone. I mean, you can, it's the, the digital archives, our, our, our digital archives work just as well on your phone, your iPad and mobile device, computer. So yes. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a question regarding the the backstory. You, you kind of gave us a little bit of you and and uh, Terry both gave us a a little bit of a backstory of the uh, voting records about how the county originally had them and then they became uh, the domain of the state. But what is the backstory on your poor farm records? I mean, how did you come to to get these records? Well, it was. They, um, oh, go ahead, Terry. I was just going to say they were accessioned in 1996 from the health department and. I believe that um, the, the latest iteration of the poor farm, the poor farm operated as a poor farm until about 1965. And then the property was turned into, the poor farm had already operated in some ways as a de facto uh, elder care place. And then it became an actual elder care place under the state or under the county health department in the mid to late sixties. And uh, then when it was closed in 1982, I believe all of those records uh, just sat with the health department until they sold the building. The building was sold to a group, couple of developers named the McMinimans. If you're familiar in Oregon with McMinimans, they're repurposed historic properties as hotels, uh, bars, uh, restaurants, et cetera. And when they bought that property is I think when the records were transferred to us. And so we have the full set of the poor farm records here. Uh, in the, in the county archives, uh, full set being the full set of records from the current location. The poor farm actually operated in the West Hills of Portland from the mid 1870s, but we don't have any records of that part. Thank you. And then I have another question uh, regarding the records you were showing earlier, uh, the voter records. Um, you mentioned uh, on the voter registration card that it mentioned the precinct number do you have maps that correspond, you know, uh, to the where the precinct was in relation to the map of the city? We do. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, they're not digitized, but we do have them. Wonderful. Uh, let's see here. Now, I also have a question about the backstory. Uh, once again, how you came upon the records for the the criminal records from 1939 through 1942, the cards. Yeah, they're, they're actually books. And uh, that's an interesting story because the Oregon Historical Society uh, was prodded by the uh, City of Portland archives to return city records in their holdings. And it turned into a large project to return government records in their holdings to the appropriate government archives. And so the Historical Society transferred about 70 cubic feet, so like a standard archives box of uh, records, <coughs> excuse me, uh, back to us in about, I think it's like 2013, 2014. And this was part of that collection. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, now, I, you know, you mentioned, you showed the picture of the, of the boys outside. I think it was a library building that, the, with the two, the two boys wearing the overalls next to each other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned just a few minutes ago about crowdsourcing. <coughs> Have you ever thought about taking your, your unidentified uh, pictures and putting them into like a Facebook page or, you know, or, or you know, oh, part of your website, your online website, and see if people in the community or people who have moved out of the community could actually ID the people in these unidentified pictures? I think that's Paige's crowdsourcing project. Well, as it happens, <laughs> I actually, I took a note while Terry was talking. We have um, Archives Month comes up in October, and we've been um, brainstorming ideas for engaging community members. And that was exactly what I wrote down. <laughs> We need to develop a series, um, and we've been um, working on other similar projects. But yeah, I, I that's exactly we're on the same page, Sue. Yeah. <laughs> the city, of, it the city of Portland archives does. Uh, they have basically printed out mystery uh, photographs into binders and books, and when they get people that come in and want to browse through them, they can just mark right on them and mark whatever information they might have about the picture, and so. It's a, good, it's a good community engagement thing. I'm also the archivist of the Oregon Country Fair, and we're going to do something similar there once the pandemic uh, uh, control allows us to have uh, physical country fairs again. 
it, 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 these, this picture actually reminded me of something I did in a library back in the early 90s before we you know, had like you know, Facebook pages and stuff like that available to us. Uh, we had, I worked in a library and we had you know, years and years, it was an academic library. We had years and years of pictures of people at the school. And, uh, you know, but unfortunately, uh, even though all those pictures had been stored in the library in, in um, uh, photo albums to preserve the history of the school, nobody ever wrote on the back of the pictures who these people were. <laughs> uh, so what we did is we had a big glass window as you come into the library and uh, we, we, we put the copies of the pictures on, and we paste them onto the window and, and we put post-it notes on the other side of the window. And we just let everyone who would walk by, whether they're a current employee or you know just a visitor or whatever, if they knew who the person was, they would take a post-it note and put it on the picture. And every day, you know, if we found a, a post-it note, we would write on the back of the picture. But of course now with Facebook, you don't have to do that. Or, you right. know, you know, websites where you can, you know, digitize the photos and put it on there with, and let people, you know, mark them. You know, it's all different now than it was then, but that this picture made me think of that story. <laughs> we do have a non-genealogical, but a archives related question from Sarah in the chat box. Um, uh, Sarah says, can you talk more about his tattoo work as listed in his bio? Um, were you interested in some specific, Sarah, or just generally? Just general. Oh, okay. Um, so it's, it, was an, it was a presentation that I made. I can actually, I'll, I'll make a note here to, to put the link in. Um, at the Society of American Archivists with a couple of archivist friends of mine really thinking about the idea of tattoos as personal archives, the idea that you are recording information in, and trying to transmit something to people, which is kind of what archives is about. But, it, but I start thinking about this in the genealogical context. And when you think of something like Maori Tamoko, which is really a full, in some cases, six, 700 years of genealogical information tattooed on individual bodies. So you can immediately see family lineage, you can see social status, you can see uh, community relationships, all of that stuff is tattooed directly, a lot of times on the face, but up and down the uh, torso as well. And so I think that the main reason that we thought about tattoos as personal archives is number one, we were all the people that participated were tattooed. So we just thought that was our area to talk about. But the idea I think is more broadly that we often forget about all the different ways we transmit information from generation to generation besides just books and correspondence and vital records. And there's a, there's a lot of other ways that that information's out there and that um, we were just encouraging archivists to, to broaden, their, broaden their aspect and broaden their, their point of view about what constitutes um, information and cultural memory and how to, how to um, try and look for a broader picture and be more inclusive in, in ways that people can tell their stories. You know, Terry, I, I, as a librarian, I'd like to add something to that. Um, I know that with genealogy, it's a lot of people view genealogy, I think erroneously, uh, as a hobby, you know, rather mm -hmm. than an actual field of, of, of uh, you know, research, worthy of research. And uh, one of the things that I struggle with every day uh, in, in the college uh, environment is convincing faculty that it is a valid field of study, you know, and how you can incorporate genealogy into the curriculum of other things like the English department, the art department, um, you know, dance, um, folklore, uh, poetry, um, you know, real estate. I mean, you know, it, it can really be incorporated very easily into the curriculum if people would broaden their horizons about their understanding or their, their preconception of, of the field of genealogy. So right. I, I applaud you, Terry, for, you know, for, you know, uh, approaching archivists and asking them to think outside of the box of the traditional fields of study in archivist um, education. So, you know, uh, once again, I applaud you for that. Oh, uh, oh, and also, uh, Terry, I wanted to say your daughter's pretty darn lucky to have a father who's an archivist to help her with her genealogy. <laughs> I don't help her with anything. I just give her some sources and turn them. <laughs> 
also I want to say I, want I, to I need to leave Paige because James is here so I've got a, a, oh. a picture that's coming and I need to um, right but thank you all for the invite and uh it's been real fun doing this and it'd be great to do it again thank you Terry uh-huh and Paige, I wanted to point out uh, er earlier in the presentation, Terry had mentioned uh, using alternate record sources to prove something. He, I think he used the sample of uh, somebody approached him for naturalization records, but he found a voting record which proved citizenship uh, as well. So I, I, I thought that was something that I really appreciate you pointing out to the students uh, because you know sometimes we're also you know focused on finding right. one particular record that we forget that there might be another record that might be able to prove the same thing. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, class, do you have any uh, last questions? You can either turn on your microphone or put it into the chat box. Let's see here. I see one thing in the chat box. Let's see here. Okay, she, that was just Sarah saying thank you. So we'll give it a few more moments and uh, let everyone ask their final questions. And, and Paige, I think you put your contact information on your handout, correct? Yes, it is here. Um, it's in our introductions area. Um, but Terry, Terry did the, I don't know, uh, I haven't seen the actual handout that Terry sent me. So um, hopefully it's on there as well. That's wonderful. We go ahead. We're since we're still recording, uh, the the screen you have up right now is going to be there for the students to see. So okay. Well, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So before I say thank you and sign off, I want to remind the class that uh, we will be going for another hour and a half after the uh, guest speaker signs off today, and we will be working uh, individually or, or in small groups or large groups, depending on how many people stay after on helping you with your brick walls. Uh, and just, if you wanna just you know work on your tree with us, we're more than happy to uh, work with you for the next hour and a half. Uh, if you just wanna talk about genealogy, stick around. If you wanna work on your tree, stick around. So with that page, I'm gonna say thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, once again, thank you for letting us record this today as well. I will be sending you the link as soon as our marketing department is done with it. And uh, once again, thank you very much. Oh, hold on, let me just check the chat box one more time. Yep, that's it. Okay, well, Paige, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and thank you both for a wonderful presentation today. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. This was a, it was an honor. And um, I also wanted to say thank you um, uh, for providing public access to an academic library. I think that's fairly rare. And I, I heard you say that and I, I thought, I just thought, I just remarked upon it because I don't think, I think that's a, it's, it's a rare opportunity. So, and thank you very much for having us.